Well, frankly, the, the kindness is on uh, your part. Uh, thank you so much for having my wife and me uh, to be able to be with you, to be part of the One Hope Weekender. Uh, what a joy to see hungry-hearted people uh, l- loving uh, the, the teaching on mentoring and discipling one another. I was so thankful for that. And I'm glad to be with you today. So if you open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter is writing to, uh, to a number of churches. Uh, if you think, okay, where were they? They were in modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor. And in that setting, they were facing a lot of oppressiveness. You know, the Jewish people certainly weren't happy about what was going on, but these people were living in much more of a Roman area, Gentile area, and the Romans weren't happy about what was going on. And, and so they were trying to shape the thinking and identity of the church by pressing them down. Now, same thing goes on today. I mean, if we listen to what the world says we are, we're going to go crawl in a hole. We've got to see, what does God say about the church? Who is the church? Well, Peter's helping us to see that in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to consider verses 9 and 10. Hear God's word. But you, talking about the church, he's not talking about individuals, so think church here. Think about what's going on with this body. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is God's word. May he write that word on our hearts. Well, what is the church apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ? I mean, all that we are, all that we have is in Jesus Christ. And yet there are plenty of examples of what the church is not. Um, The church has often become just a social gathering. People from similar backgrounds get together and and have meals and talk about nice things and complain about things they find objectionable in society. And they participate in religious practices and rituals. And they engage in civic projects. And maybe the, the, the greatest concern they have is they want to feel good about themselves. And so that's why they exist. That's why they call themselves a church. And you can find these churches in all sorts of areas. They're They're in urban areas, in rural areas, in suburban areas. And they gather in all kinds of places. Some of them have ornate steepled buildings. Some meet in storefronts. Some meet in multi-complex structures. Some meet in clapboard siding buildings. And their people are of all ethnicities, rich and poor and elegant and simple and vocal and silent and coat and tie and shorts and blue jeans and t-shirts and aside from tacking the name of Jesus to some of their programs or tossing the name of Jesus around in their worship service or using Jesus' name to give them some kind of authenticity as a Christian church, they really do just fine without him. They don't really need him because he's just a prop to keep up their appearance of spirituality. But he's not their life and breath. He's not, as we were singing a moment ago, their joy and their hope. He is not their desire and their passion. They like being a so-called Christian church without getting overly serious about Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord who told us to take up our cross and follow him. Back in the late 70s, my wife and I lived in New Orleans, and I was working in a department store while I was also going to school, and and my boss invited Karen and me to attend Easter services with him at his church. And 
If you've been to New Orleans, you know, like Baltimore, it's an old city. They've got these gorgeous old buildings. And so uh, we went to this church. It was a magnificent, stately building. Uh, it was old, tall steeple, great uh, uh, cathedral ceiling, uh, lots of stonework, lots of carvings. Uh, they, they had everything you wanted. They had this massive pipe organ and they had the robe choir. They had the high pulpit. But when we left, we didn't feel like we'd been to church. You know the feeling? You know, we, we, we got there and there was lots of noise, but there was no life. There was lovely music, but there was no passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. There were a lot of up and down, a lot of readings, and some of those readings were wonderful as they were scripture but there is no gospel centrality to what they were proclaiming and who they were. Now, contrast that, I was in Brazil a number of years ago, and I was preaching in a church, and I was shocked by how worldly the church was and how worldly the service was when it was supposed to be a worship service. It was just entertainment. There was lightheartedness. There was boisterous laughter. There was, there was lewdness. But there was no sense of the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no real consciousness of the gospel. Uh, there was no thought of holiness. It was so bad that my translator slipped over behind me and started whispering in my ear and said, Are you okay? Are you sure you're going to be able to go on? And by the grace of God, I did. They may have wished that I hadn't, but by the grace of God, I did, preaching on justification in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus was just a prop for them. It was a prop to be entertained. Uh, they did not see him as the Lord before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God that he is the Lord of all. But... When Jesus does his saving work, and this is where Peter is helping us to see. When Jesus does his saving work in a people and he gathers them out as a church, out of darkness, as he says, in, into his marvelous light, then everything's different. It's different not because of the people. I mean, you've got all kinds of people. It's different because of the Lord Jesus dwelling in those people. Not because they're so schooled in Christianity, but because he has delivered them from darkness and brought them into the kingdom of his dear son through the gospel. Those Jesus saves, he inhabits with identity and clarity that they belong to him. Now, Peter understood this. He called the church in the opening of this passage, or the opening of this chapter, or in chapter 1 in this letter, he called the church those who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, unto the obedience of Jesus Christ, being sprinkled with his blood. You notice he didn't say anything about their organizational structure. He didn't say anything about their buildings or about their program or how well regarded they were in the community, or how popular they were with the influencers. They were the elect of God. Those sanctified by the Holy Spirit, blood-bought and transformed by the Lord Jesus into a relationship of obedience to Him. And they were no different than this church and other churches that have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are what we are by the work of Christ, period. And God gives us all we need in Christ so that we might be his people that are living out the gospel in the world. That, that's why this text is so helpful to us. Because the world is kind of pounding our heads to press us down so we'll hide but the Word of God helps us to get our heads around the reality of who the church of Jesus is. And so we can get all kinds of muddled ideas about the church, especially with the way the church caricature, or the world caricatures the church with demeaning terms. But Peter makes it clear that God's saving work by the grace of God in Jesus Christ 
through his death and resurrection, gives the church assurance, purpose, and a sense of divine wonder. You know, why are these central to our identity and to our mission? That is what I want us to think about under three headings. First, you'll notice that he gives assurance of who you are, not as an individual, but who you are corporately as the church. I mean, how would you describe the church? Uh, Peter wanted to contrast those who were maybe very religious, but they didn't belong to God. He's going to get to that in in just a little bit in, in our text. But you'll notice in uh, verses 4 through 8, he, he's giving a contrast. He's talking about those who are in Christ. They come to him uh, as to a living stone rejected by men, choice and precious in the sight of God. And then he says in verse 4, you also as living stones, you're joined to him. You've been affected by his resurrection. You are being built up. You're not building yourselves up. Christ is building you up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood so that you would offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and gives his contrast and says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. And so he uses this imagery of Jesus that you find in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and in the Psalms, of Christ being a stone, and he said, if you believe in him, you're not going to be disappointed. And that's another way of saying, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to be thrilled. You're going to be thankful. You're going to be deeply affected. And he said, this precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, This is very intentional. For those who disbelieve, the stone, referring to Jesus, uh, which the builders rejected, this stone became the very cornerstone. Now, what what does it mean by that? It means everything that God is building, everything God the Father is building, he's building on Jesus Christ. Everything. 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 So, Those who are disbelieving are rejecting the one upon whom God is building everything. And then he says, he, Jesus, to them is a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. And then Peter says, but. All right, you you see what he's doing? That but is showing a contrast here. He says, I want to show you something different. He's alerting us that the church of Jesus Christ is different. That you are not who you are because you've rejected him. No, you are who you are by the work of God through Jesus' redeeming work in the church. Notice what he says in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now, if these words sound familiar, it's because they are. Because what Peter does, he's just pulling phrases out of the Old Testament. And he says, this is who the church is. He's not saying, this is who Israel is. He's saying, this is who the church is. Now, that raises an interpretive question for us. And it's a really important one. If these identities were spoken of ancient Israel, how are they now properly used of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just in the first century, but right now. I mean, was Peter getting his interpretive wires crossed? Well, I want you to think about these original passages, see how they were used in the Old Testament, and now see what Peter's doing. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, captures three of these phrases. For you are a holy people, you hear it? You are a holy people to the Lord your God, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Peter says, that's what God is saying about the church. And then in Deuteronomy 4.20, but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people 
for his own possession as today. And then similarly, when Isaiah was prophesying about the return of the children of Israel out of captivity in Babylon in Isaiah 43 verses 20 and 21, he, he speaks of how the creation itself will serve God's people whom he calls my chosen people. And he says these people have a distinct purpose. The people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. You, you hear that ring? Same thing Peter is saying. Isaiah 61, 6 adds, but you will be called the priest of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. And then Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, at Sinai, when Moses is getting ready to declare the Ten Commandments, he, the, the Lord says, then you shall be my possession. You hear the language? You shall be my possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then to maintain that that same kind of distinction that Peter is giving, the prophet Malachi, Malachi 3.17 wrote, They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Now, Do you hear what Peter's doing? He's teaching us how to read the Bible, by the way. Because sometimes we get the idea, oh, the Old Testament, that was about Israel and the Jews. The New Testament's all about us. Brothers and sisters, the Bible's a Jesus book. It's a Jesus book. From Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation, it is a Jesus book. And so Peter is helping us to understand this. I mean, here's his interpretive grid that God doesn't have two separate peoples, Israel and the church, and never the twain shall meet. But rather, he has one people, all redeemed by the bloody death of the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately presented as a bride to the Son. Y'all are studying Revelation on Wednesday nights. You're going to get to that. Sheer glory. Uh, Tom Schreiner said God's elect nation is no longer commensurate with Israel, but embraces the church of Jesus Christ, which is comprised of Jews and Gentiles. So God's aim before the creation was the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ foreshadowed in the elect people of Israel, but brought to fruition and to fullness in the church established by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we notice these four descriptions. Notice the first one, your chosen race. You remember how God chose Abraham. Not because Abraham was a great religious guy. He was religious, but it was pagan religion. Joshua talked about that. The Lord brought him out of paganism. He chose him, and he made his heirs to be God's own possession. And that gives us a type of divine election by which God chooses undeserving people out of the world for himself through whom the Lord identifies as a peculiar race of people. You are a chosen race. And yet, in Christ, we have a new race from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, as Revelation 5 tells us. And I I love what Karen Jobes wrote about, uh, about this, that this passage rightly states that this declaration of chosen race is the foundational cure for evils of racism in human society because the many races of the redeemed constitute a new race of those who've been born again by the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They weren't chosen because of their personal worth or achievement or ethnicity, but they were chosen out of the great mercy of God who cast his redeeming love upon them. And he brings all of them from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation into the fellowship of his Son by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so this chosen race is the redeemed people, redeemed through the cross of Christ. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt and the consequent deliverance of Israel from the Babylonian captivity are, are to help us visualize a far greater deliverance. We're delivered from sin and Satan and death 
by the bloody death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That other deliverance from Egypt and Babylon is temporal. It was good. They were glad to have it. But it didn't last forever. It's only what Jesus does that lasts forever. And, you know, maybe some sitting here today, oh, if I can just get set free from this or that, I'm going to really feel like everything's going well in my life. You've got to think about it. You're going to die one day. And so all those things, good as they are, they're going to end. Only what Christ does last. Only what he does last. And so because of that delivering work of Jesus, he makes us one new people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, he talks about a royal priesthood. John uses language similar to Peter in Revelation 1.5, and he's quoting from Exodus 19.6. He says, he's made us to be a kingdom priest to our God and Father. And that, that word royal means we belong to the king. We belong to his kingdom. So he's talking about a priesthood that belongs to the people of God. Now, the, the Jews, the, the people of Israel, had one tribe that were priestly, the tribe of Levi. Not so with the church. I'm looking at a bunch of priests. Not individually, corporately. That's how our priesthood is, ex- is expressed. That's why membership in the church is so important. That's why your responsibility and your contribution to this congregation is so critical because you comprise this holy priesthood that, that God has established through Jesus Christ. You say, well, what are we doing as priests? Well, you, you, you're not soloing. No, you're a chorus together as priests. And you are offering up the sacrifice of your lives, as Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2 uh, teaches us. You're offering yourself up to God through Jesus Christ. You're offering the, the, the sacrifice of your lips, giving thanks unto his name. You're praising the Lord Jesus, as Hebrews thirteen fifteen tells us. You're offering the gospel witness to the nations, as he says later in verse 9 in our text. Uh, you're offering your prayers without ceasing, as 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us. You're offering the sacrifices of doing good and sharing with one another, as Hebrew 13.16 uh, tells us. So, what are you? You're a priest. He said, you're a chosen race, a royal priest. said, third, you're a holy nation or a holy people. Uh, one source says this idea of, of nation or people is a body of persons united by kinship, culture, in common traditions. So he's, he's identifying us and, he, and he's saying there's something unique about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you are a holy people group. You as the church are marked out by a common kinship. You've been birthed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. You have a common culture. It is centered in the gospel. It is a gospel culture. You have common traditions that arise out of the sound doctrine that now we receive from the Lord in the Word and we're putting into practice as the redeemed. And then he further defines us. He says that you are a holy nation. You see, a group gathering and calling themselves a church, but not holy, is not a church. Now, how does that affect us individually in how we're living? And that's one of the things that Peter's doing. You'll, you'll notice in verse 11, uh, he, he tells him, I urge you as aliens and strangers, abstain from the fleshly lust which wage war against the soul. So he's giving these exhortations. Earlier in chapter 1, uh, Peter takes on the language of, Le- of Leviticus in verses 15 and 16. He says, like the Holy One who called you, you also be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Now, that's what the work of sanctification is doing. We are made holy as as we're redeemed. We're made holy in Christ. And now the Holy Spirit is working that holiness in us and out of us. And you say, well, what does that holy mean? That means you belong to Christ. You don't belong to the world. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to Christ. You're you're set apart. You belong to him. Now, holiness makes the world very uncomfortable. 
You, you realize that, don't you? I mean, in, in Peter's day, the Roman government was really uncomfortable about these holy people, so they were persecuting them. And we see the same thing going on in our day. But we must not shrink from being a holy people but so that our lives might mirror the life of Christ. And we don't make ourselves holy. You don't become holy by following a bunch of rules and regulations and checking the list. You're holy in Christ. And as you're holy in Christ, you are living in obedience unto him. Remember that opening phrase in 1 Peter, that you're chosen, you're sanctified unto the obedience of Jesus Christ being sprinkled by his blood. The fourth characteristic that in fourth description, he says, you are a people for God's own possession. And this is repeated several times in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy and Malachi, and it's really an encompassing phrase. The word possession means God keeps us for himself. He keeps us for himself because he bought us by the bloody death of his own son. And what kind of possession would God have? He would have those that he chose that he might put his electing love on them and save them through his son. God would have those that he brings into this royal priesthood so that we serve him by our lips and by our lives. He would have those who are a holy people so that our lives resemble his life. We're marked by the Spirit of God working in our lives, our work, our family, our relationships, our service, our worship, our witness. To be God's possession means we no longer belong to the world. That's why Paul told the Philippians, Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's why Peter, later on in that verse I read a moment ago, in verse 11 in our text, he says, you're aliens and strangers, so you abstain from the fleshly lusts that, give, that wage war against the soul. It's what Jesus was telling the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He essentially said, if you're mine then live like your mind, or else you have no authenticity as my people. I love the way John Calvin summarized this. When he spoke of the church and these, these four descriptions of the church, he said there's a contrast between us and the rest of mankind to be considered. And hence, it appears more fully how incomparable is God's goodness towards us, for he sanctifies us who by nature are polluted. He chose us when he could find nothing in us but filth and vileness. He makes us his peculiar possession from worthless dregs. And he confers the honor of the priesthood on the profane. He brings vassals of Satan, sin, and death into the enjoyment of royal liberty. That's who we are. Listen to what the world says about the church. See what God says. All right. So here's the assurance of who you are as a church. You, as he says in verse 9, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. But second, what is the purpose in your focus as the church? So here we are, this unique people of God. But what is the church about? How do we define our mission? It's very popular in our day for churches to have mission statements. When I was coming, coming up as a young believer and as a young pastor, nobody ever mentioned mission statements. I mean, that, that's something that came on years down the road. And, and so, you know, people look on websites, what is this church's mission statement? What are they doing? Where are they spending their energies and resources and time? And all that can be very good. But this is what Peter says your mission statement is. So that, verse 9, so that... You know, you are this chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now notice the plural, excellencies, not just one excellency, but all the things that we find that are praiseworthy in the Lord God, he says we're to proclaim them. And he's certainly speaking about the character and attributes and ways of God. It's those aspects of the nature and being of God that we just don't find in the same dimension in humanity. 
They're uncommonly found in the Lord God. And so we think of his love and grace and his beauty and joy and his wisdom and power and his mercy and goodness and justice and wrath and patience and kindness. Do you meditate on those things? Do you start reading in the Word and all of a sudden, there's one of those excellencies. Do you stop? Do you get your thoughts on that? Be wowed by that and say, I've got something to talk about. I can tell someone about what I'm seeing in the Lord God. Peter says these are things we ought to proclaim. But can we think of the excellencies of the Lord God without thinking about the redeeming work that he did through his son? I mean, do our minds not immediately run to the plan of God before the creation of the world to send the son, not as a reaction to the fall, but purpose and plan before the fall so that the son might save a people for himself? Do we not think of the incarnation when the eternal Son of God became a human being living this mundane life, normal life as a child in the humble means of a village in Nazareth? <clears throat> Do we not think of how Jesus identified with us in John's baptism and he went into the wilderness and he squared off with the devil and the devil could not find one little chink in Jesus' character by which he could seize upon. Do we not think of his love and his care for the downtrodden and the weak and the helpless and the sick and the diseased and the demonized and the broken? Do we not think of the cross where Jesus became sin for us, the perfect Son of God who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him? Do we not think of the empty tomb where he lay, having borne the judgment of God against us and having declared it is finished and it was finished so that we might be declared right with this holy God? Do we not think on about the third day when death could not hold him, when he burst forth from the grave, having conquered death and raised up a people whom he would bring into union with himself. Do we not think of the offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ to sinners so that repent, those repenting and believing, maybe some here today, repenting and believing, he delivers us from condemnation. He forgives our sin. He counts us righteous. He counts us righteous? Do you, you take a look in the mirror today? He counts us righteous. He delivers us. And that gospel is what we begin to live in until one day we live in his presence. Those are excellencies. And Peter says, proclaim them. But, but, but he's got a qualifier. So that, notice, so that we may, you may proclaim the excellencies, and that you is plural, by the way, in the original language, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who is called you, plural, out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he has called you, plural, you as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'd ask you, are you qualified to be proclaiming? You see what he's doing, don't you? I mean, earlier in verse 3, after he was talking about how we grow in the Lord, he says, this is true of you if you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. And now he's doing the, the very same sort of thing. He describes the church. He says, if you're one of those that has been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, by nature, we live in darkness. Our minds and our consciences are darkened to the light of God's glory. We see physically, but not spiritually. And so we go about following our sinful desires and we have no thought of this holy God who created us and who at this very moment sustains us by his mercy and by his pleasure. And then the gospel comes along. And maybe we've been blind to it for years and years and suddenly, by the mercy of God, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and our understanding so that we hear that gospel and we repent. We turn from our sin. And we believe upon this Lord Jesus who died in our place and rose from the dead and by the grace of God, in that moment, we're saved. And we look at ourselves and say, I didn't do anything. 
Jesus did it all. And that's when God brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And now we see. And now we know joy where there had been sadness and hope where there had been despair and peace where there had been trouble and anxiousness. And now we have life that never ends so that even through, uh, even though death is a feared enemy, death doesn't have the final say. Jesus does. And that's only in Christ. And so here's our mission. Talk about God's excellencies who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There it is. There, there's your mission. I mean, do you see that as your mission? You say, well, you know, I've got a lot of things going on. We all do, don't we? I've got subjects that I'm studying. I've got things that I'm working on. I've got places where I'm laboring. Yeah, that's, that's true. But all of us who've been savingly called by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a mission throughout all of that to talk about the excellencies of our Lord. So let's do that. Let's do that with that word of Christ on our lips. This is not even reserved for people with special training. There is no seminary degree necessary to do this. This is seeing the excellencies of Christ. By the grace of God, light in Christ has eclipsed the darkness. And so we just talk about it. Let that light shine through you in the way you live your life and the way you declare the good news of Christ. And so there's this assurance of who we are as a church. There is this purpose in our focus as the church. And third... There is the wonder, the awe of at the unending mercy that's been given to the church. And we see that in verse 10. And he's not starting a new subject, but rather Peter is trying to help us to say, okay, how do we get motivated to proclaim the excellencies out of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light? You'll notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't manipulate you. He doesn't say, If you don't do this, such and such is going to happen to you. He doesn't pound you and browbeat you. This is what he says. For, you notice he's given an explanation when he does that. For, you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, if you think, well, that sounds familiar too. Well, it is. It's from the book of Hosea. You remember that story? God told Hosea to go take a woman of harlotry. He found Gomer. He married her. He loved her. They had a, had a son. And then Gomer leaves and goes back into harlotry. And the Lord told, Gomer, or told Hosea, go buy her out of slavery, out of, out of her harlotry. Take her to yourself as a wife again. After all the brokenness, ruin, abuse that she had gone through, he brought her back and treasured her and loved her. Now, initially, that was showing the picture of God's love for Israel. But Peter said, that's God's love for the church. We were, we were Gomer. We, we had that kind of life. And then now Christ has come, and he's brought us to himself. And so God has redeemed this one people through Jesus Christ in his saving work on the cross. And so for decades, maybe for many of you, for decades, you were not a people of God, but now by the grace of God you are. You had not received mercy, but now, now you've received mercy. There was nothing you could do to make yourself receive mercy. That was the act of God. That was the grace of God. And so if this is true of you, if you were not a people but uh, of God and now through Christ you are, if you had not received mercy but now in God's kindness in Christ you've received mercy, then we cannot be silent about the excellencies of our gracious God. So you see how the Bible motivates us? If you say, you know, I'm having trouble kind of getting myself going Go read about the cross of Christ. Go read about what Jesus did. Go read about what it is to be counted righteous in Jesus Christ. And let that motivate you so that seeing the greatness of God's love, seeing his mercy, then you just have this habit of talking about the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you can do that. 
You can do that because you're a chosen race, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession who now, because you're his people, because you know that mercy, who now are proclaiming the graciousness of the Lord. May God give us grace to do that. Pray with me. Pray with me. Perhaps there are some among us in that statement, not a people of God, not a people of God. And you would have to say, I understand that's me. Not having received mercy, and you would say, I understand that's me. I want you to know that God is gracious, that Christ welcomes all to him who will come his way, repenting, turning from your sin, believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your sin bearer, believing that in Christ alone do you have righteousness, believing that Jesus is sufficient to save you, and you trust him. And as Jesus said, you take up your cross and you follow him. There are pastors, elders, deacons here, church members here that would love to talk to you about that. Please, please do so. For the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's just be the church. Let's be these people of God proclaiming the excellencies of the one who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Lord Jesus, thank you for your saving work. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that your goodness overshadows all of our brokenness, all of our neediness. And you meet us with your kindness and your saving mercies. And we pray that you would work deeply in this body. That where you have brought them, you will take them still further in their walk with you. Further into their joys in you. Further into their gospel impact in this community and around the globe. We pray for those who are unbelieving that you might show your saving mercy and by that work of the Holy Spirit, open their eyes and understanding and bring them to life in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.